wonderful publisher uh, for producing such a beautiful book. Uh, it, it looks wonderful, the cover is wonderful, uh, the translation is, is excellent, everything about it is, has worked out really well, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, secondly, I'd like to say I'm happy to be here with Sarah Kiploki, who I think is one of the greatest. Um, he's not just a great historian of Ukraine, he's also a great historian of Ukraine in America. He writes very beautifully in English and I think is a wonderful ambassador for Ukraine in a way that maybe it's important that Ukrainians um, know. And thirdly, I'd like to say I'm really happy to be here, especially in Lviv. Um, Lviv is the first Ukrainian city that I ever visited, and I came here for the first time in 1990. Um, I came here with my husband. We drove here over the border from Poland. We waited for, I think, a whole day across the border in that very difficult time. And of course, now you can fly back and forth very, very easily. Um, and it was a very, very different city um, you know, all those many years ago. And I'm delighted to see. How, um, how much it has changed and how wonderful it looks. And I'm very happy to be here at this particular book forum. Um, having, having said that, you know, that, that comment is part of the answer to your question. So, you know, why did I become interested in Eastern Europe, um, first in Poland, really first in Russia, actually, and then in Poland and then in Ukraine? And the answer is probably a lot to do with timing. Um, I first became interested in, you know, it was very difficult in the 1980s when I went to university not to know about the Cold War, which was very much part of our politics then. Um, and for me, there was an attraction to try to learn Russian, to speak Russian, to understand um, what was happening on the other side of the Iron Curtain. Um, but then, really, I was lucky enough to first visit Central Europe, really first to Poland, um, in the middle of the 1980s when it was a really exciting place to be because you could feel that things were happening. Um, and in a way, I was drawn into this region because of what happened here, because of 1989, because of the independence movement here in the late 1980s and 1990s, um, because of the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. And, you know, from a... I know that if you live here, you know, your own troubles and your own history can seem very boring and mundane. But believe me, step back a little bit and look at this part of the world um, from an outside point of view and you see this extraordinary dynamic moment of change where everybody had to make all kinds of difficult choices. Um, and writing about that and understanding it and understanding it both as a journalist, in other words, trying to understand what's happening now, why is it, you know, why is the Soviet Union falling apart, but also then later on for me trying to understand, okay, I understand why it's falling apart, it's a terrible system, it's dysfunctional, it's cruel. Later on I began to ask myself, okay, how did it get to be that way in the first place? And this drew me back first into the history of the Gulag, then into the history of the Sovietization of Central Europe, which is my topic of my second book, and then finally the history of Ukraine. Um, and my book about Ukraine was, you know, part of me trying to answer the question of, you know, that, you, that for you all is, is um, maybe mundane, but for me is interesting, you know, why is Ukraine the way it is? Um, and part of the answer is to do with Ukrainian history. And so, you know, really what drew me to this region is you, you know, you in Ukraine, you in the region, um, and the dynamism and, um, and the changes in your societies. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, w one word that you mentioned more than once in, in this answer was word journalism. And, and, and there exactly where you started, and we are here today launching not translation of your travel log, which went through more than one edition uh, since 1990 or 1991 when it appeared, but uh, launching a book of history. And um, this is uh, the, the, the phenomenon of someone who was trained as a journalist and, and goes into history is quite rare, not just for Ukraine, but for this part of the world in general. There is a tradition of looking down at something that is called the popularization of history, uh, which is part of the DNA 
in, in the region as a whole, it seems to me, Poland. Not, not just Ukraine. Uh, right, right. Po Poland, uh, Poland, uh, and Russia in the same in the same, uh, it seems to me, place as well. But it's it's different in the United States. It's different in the United States. What the work that you were engaged in was was absolutely considered to be legitimate by the American standards. This summer, there was an entire discussion in the uh, journal, it seems to me, Contemporary U uh, European History, of the key figures in the history of uh, the famine and, and Ukrainian famine, Holodomor in particular, which were discussed in your book. So how do, how do you manage to, to, to do both, to wear this? It's two separate heads depending on the part of the day, or it's the same head that is designed in a particular way. Uh, I, I think this is, uh, again, the, the, you're a kind of public intellectual that, that mm, this part of the world is still, to pre to, uh, it's still waiting for, for a peer to produce, so if you can, if you can talk about that. Um, thank you. Yes, no, it's actually not only in Ukraine where, you know, where there's an idea that history has to be written by historians, and that means people who work in universities. Um, and, you know, and I should say from the outset that I have huge respect and admiration for historians who work in universities, and I use their work, and I admire them, and I read them, and so on. So I, this is not in any way, um, I, you know, I, have, I don't feel myself in competition with them. But actually, for me, the process of journalism and the process of history are similar. Um, it's just that your sources are different. You know, when you do journalism, you're writing the first draft of history. You know, you're, you're interviewing someone or you're seeing something and you're making a kind of instant interpretation, you know. And, and by the way, nowadays, you often have to do that very fast. When I first began as a journalist, you had more time but now you really don't have a choice. You have to say right away, here's what I think is happening and here's why. Um, and of course, journalists are, um, you know, it's not just that they make mistakes, of course everybody makes mistakes, um, but they, you know, you can never see the whole context. You know, you're interpreting something that happened that day um, and you don't know what will happen tomorrow. Um, and with history, you're re it's really the same process. Why did something happen? What were the motivations? Um, and you have, more, you have more perspective to think about it, you have more time, you can use written sources, you can use documents that aren't available to you um, as, as a journalist. But essentially, um, they're the same thing. They're trying to explain, you know, why are events happening the way they're happening? What are the motivations? What are, people's, what are people trying to do? What are the big ideas behind the motivations? And I don't find them kind of intellectually to be that different. I mean, mm -hmm. they require a different kind of effort. You know, history, you need to, um, I mean, in, in, and then also I would say in a way, history is easier in that you have more time, you have more sources, you, you have, you, you can, you can, um, you know, you can be more measured and more nuanced in your analysis, whereas journalism, of course, you have to do it fast. Um, but, you know, as, I, as I, I often find that the two for me are very, it's useful to do both because they inform one another. And as I said, all of my history books are reactions to, um, I mean, they're, they're attempts to explain the contemporary world. So why did I write about the Ukrainian famine? Because I wanted to understand Ukraine. Why is Ukraine the way it is now? Um, why did I write about the Sovietization of Central Europe? Because I was there in 1989, I saw communism fall apart, and so I start to ask, you know, okay, how did it get to be that way in the first place? And I think, um, you know, the past and the present, you know, you can sort of use the one to interrogate the other. I mean, you know, of course, this is different if you're writing the history of ancient Greece, or, or you're writing the history of, um, you know, the Middle Ages, although even so, I, I, even then, I, I think even then, I mean, you, you would know this, I think even then, many people really are interrogating the past in order to understand the present, or to understand, if not present society, then something deeper about humanity. So I, 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 don't, I don't really see that these are separate, separate subjects. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I wasn't happy to hear that history is easier to do than, than journalism. Easier but I have, is the wrong word. But, no, but, it's but, more, but it's more time consuming. Yes, but, yes. but you have you have more time, you know. But right. um, yes, I mean, of course, it's also true that having more sources and having more information 
of course, makes the, it more confusing. Yeah. You know? well, I wasn't happy to hear that, but I agree basically with, <laughs> with I agree with the argument. Uh, you are exceptionally productive. And, and um, uh, if you just look at the books of, of history, of pure history. You've, you've written more books than I have, but thank uh, you. But, but, uh, but, but you, you do what, it's weekly column, it's maybe more than that. So there is a lot of publications in, in, in uh, newspapers, in journals, and today online. And among other things, you wrote a, a cookbook, something that maybe one day we will, we will launch here as well. But looking, looking strictly at, 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 at history, this is your third book on history. So the first one was on Gulag, the second one was the Iron Curtain, so Gulag was on Gulag, the Iron Curtain was on, subtitle was Crushing Eastern Europe, it seems to me, so it was 1945 to early 60s, it seems to me, story. And uh, now it's its book on the famine on Holodomor, uh, and it's it's not just 1932, 1933, or 1932-34. It's it, it, it takes a chunk of, of history, Soviet history, Ukrainian history. So what was what have you learned from this book in, in a broader sense that you didn't know, that you maybe didn't know or before, or maybe whether it changed at all your understanding of, 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 of the Soviet and communist experiment as a whole, because all three books deal, deal with, that, with that broader subject. So I think as you and I have discussed <coughs> before, the, the big revelation to me, or the, the sort of understanding that I got from this book, was that the famine was not a story that could be written about as a phenomenon of Stalinism or of the 1930s. Um, <clears throat> I very much started out thinking that this was a book about two years, you know, 1932 and 1933. Um, and then as I read into the subject, as I read archive material, but also the monographs and, and other books um, about the region and about the period, I understood that this is a, also a book in a certain sense about the Russian Revolution and about the Ukrainian Revolution. Um, and that is why the book begins not in 1930, you know, but it begins in 1917. Um, and I had to understand what it was that happened in 1917 in order to explain the famine. Um, and I think essentially the understand what was new for me, or anyway, was became more important for me was the understanding that in 1917 there was not just one revolution in Moscow; um, there were a lot of revolutions in different places and understanding what was the Ukrainian revolution, what happened in Kiev um, in 1917, who were the, you know, the, the, you know, who were the Ukrainian liberals who first tried to create a Ukrainian state, um, what happened during the Civil War, why, that, why, that, why those liberals were crushed. Um, this was not a story that I knew, or I, if I knew it, it was very vague. Um, and I also hadn't understood how important the violence of that period was, the violence of the Civil War, mm -hmm. of the pogroms, um, uh, but also of the, you know, the, this, this wasn't just three-way, it was this kind of five-way war between the Bolsheviks, the White Army, the Ukrainians, um, you know, and lots of other, the Poles and lots of other groups. And understanding how, how violence and that kind of ethnic violence had shaped the revolution and the thinkings of the revolutionaries, and including the thinking of Stalin, um, was really important. You know, the Bolshevik Revolution was the result not just of a single moment, you know, in St. Petersburg in, 19, you know, in 1917, it was also the result of this incredibly bloody, vicious ethnic war. And in a way, the Ukrainian famine was a continuation of that war. Um, 10 years later. And so the, the, the famine helped me understand where this, um, you know, where the tendency for mass murder came from in Soviet history. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 you know, this was a revolution born in mass murder. You know, there were these, um, you know, the violence of, the, of 1918, 1919, 1920 um, was really what shaped the thinking of, of everybody else after that, and it helps explain um, the rest of the period. So I think in that sense, this book was, um, really important for me. It also is the book that made me feel like I didn't want to spend any more time in my life with Stalin. Mm -hmm. 
I, I've, now I've spent a lot of time reading him and understanding him and thinking about him, and that's enough. That's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, your book is, is, is uh, quite unique for, for, the, for the study of famine in Soviet history on a number of levels. One of them was, when it comes to famine, this unusual time frame when you focus not just on two years, but you look on the process and, and uh, explain what happened through that, uh, through that history of the previous 10, uh, 10 to 15 years. But another unique part is that you seem to be much more kind of um, in, in, uh, rooted in and, and engaged in, with the uh, works of Ukrainian historians. And then, uh, and kind of average scholar in the West writing about that. And uh, um, we here, we are, we are struggling with this question, okay, we publish, or at least in, not in my case, but in the majority of historians, we publish in Ukrainian. They don't know us over there. There are problems with, with communication. Some important work that being done is not noticed. And uh, I, I wonder what, what, what was your impression overall about the, the, the state of the Ukrainian scholarship in particular on the famine and what is, what is good and where maybe we all as, as a group, as historians, should maybe pay more attention and move. So for you coming from, not outside of the field broadly, but certainly outside of the field of the study of famine. So first of all, I'd like to say that the, you know, the, the state of Ukrainian history, I think is, I mean, particularly because I know a little bit about the state of Russian history, um, I think is incredibly healthy. I mean, what's interesting about the, the scholarship and the historiography of the famine is there are live debates about it. So there are disagreements. In other words, it's not like one line is being given from the government, and this is the government line, and everybody follows it, which you do see in some other countries in this region. It's a, it's a very lively field. There are different, you know, there are different opinions. Um, in some points in the book, I tried to show some of the different arguments. You know, one person thinks, has one interpretation of the famine, another has another. Um, there are, there is a, there's quite a lot of research being done. Um, there's a lot of material available. Um, the Ukrainian archives are very open and very easy to use, which is not the case also in every country in the region. I mean, it's not even the case in every Western European country. Um, more or less in Kiev, you can walk in, you know, show an ID card and sit anywhere. Please sit down and stay here as long as you want. There's no... Um, there's no control over what you what you see and so on. So I mean, it's actually a very, in that sense, a really healthy um, community. And I, I to the the Ukrainian historians who I spoke to were all extremely helpful and friendly and so on. So um, I don't have I, I'm I'm glad I was able to use their work and there was an enormous amount of it, particularly about the Holodomor. Um, you know. There are, there are some pieces of the story that I'd like to know more about that I didn't have time for or didn't, um, uh, you know, there are, maybe aren't quite ready to, to study yet. One of them is, I think I spoke to Ludmila about it, this question of how the Holodomor affected different ethnic groups inside Ukraine. So not just Ukrainians, but Germans, Jews, you know, and others. And there's a little bit of material. You found some uh, interesting material about that, but it's, it, it needs a kind of its own book and its own study. <clears throat> so there's some, you know, there, that to me is a big missing piece of the story. You know, what happened? To, because we know there were other ethnic groups. We know they were around. Were they treated very differently from Ukrainian speakers and so on? And that's, that, that strikes me as a, as, a, as a missing piece of the story. But, um, but in, as I say, in general, it's a, um, oh, and I also think the, these, f the kind of financial questions, um, the, how, the, the, the value of the grain that the Soviet Union was exporting abroad, um, how that was, you know, and, and the role that played in the decision making. There's, some, there's one book about that, there could be more, it's another thing that could use more exploration. But overall I found that I, there's an enormous amount of material and I found it very useful and I did make a point of trying to quote and use um, as many Ukrainian historians as I could. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, thank you. Uh, one one of, the, of the debates that is going on certainly uh, 
in broader history and historiography of, of, of the, the Holodomor is uh, the genocide. So whether, whether it is a genocide, whether, whether it is not, there is not much of a debate going in Ukraine per se, but there is a debate on the level of what do you include in the, in the phenomenon called the Holodomor? And whether this is just you look at what happened to the peasants, whether you include in this story the, the purge of the Ukrainian party elite at that time, whether the story of Skripnik or Khvilovy are parts of, 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 the same, of the same process, something that is under the umbrella of of um, uh, either famine or Holodomor or genocide. And my question is, uh, what, uh, again, everyone who had a chance to look at the book would, would have an idea of how you approach that, but for the sake of audience, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit, uh, what, what do you do with this allegedly different narratives where the part of the same, you intervene them, did, the, did they influence one another? So in your take, in your take on, on, on the famine. So I should say at the beginning that I did not want to write a book that was an argument for genocide or against genocide. Um, I thought it was really important that there be, particularly in English, um, a book which was a history of the famine itself, what happened, why it happened. Um, <clears throat> the, the word genocide and the question of whether it was a genocide seems to me, it's obviously an extremely important question, but it's, it's one that you, sh it's an argument you should have after you've read the history. In other words, you need to know the history before you can begin to have this argument, which is essentially a political, legal, moral argument rather than a historical argument. You know, we need to establish exactly what happened and then we can talk about what it was. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so the, the book deliberately doesn't have the word genocide in the title. It's, you know, and I explain in the introduction that I will discuss it at the end. And that's really a deliberate decision. That first we agree what the history was because the history needs to be established first. Um, so th that's, that's one point. The second point is that I went back, you know, as others have done, and I looked at the history of the word genocide, the concept of genocide. And of course, as you know, it comes from, in a certain weird way, the concept comes from Lviv. Um, the person who first used the word, who invented the word, actually was a was a Polish Jewish Ukrainian scholar who come who grew up near Lviv and who studied at the law school here. Um, and I, you know, I looked at his Raphael Lemkin, Raphael Lemkin of course. Um, and I I looked at the you know the the his definition and of course his definition his understanding of the word, which is different from the definition of crimes against humanity, which a, a, a term that also comes from the University of Lviv, but that's another story. Um, what he was talking about was, what he meant by genocide was the destruction of a nation as a nation. In other words, the attempt to eliminate nations from the map. Um, and there have been other instances of this in history. He actually, he never wrote the book, but he did some, took some notes for a book that went all the way back to you know, the Spanish destruction of the Incas in Peru and, and even further back than that. And he had a very broad idea of what this meant. And this meant destroying a nation, not just physically, but culturally, its religion, its history, and so on. Um, and you know, within that definition, you know, the, the Stalin's attack on Ukraine, I think there is no question in my mind that it is a genocide in the sense that it, Stalin attempted to eliminate Ukraine as a sovereign state, as a nation. He wanted to, you know, and in that sense, of course, I would include Skripnik and I would include Khvilovy and I would include this attack on the artists and intellectuals that happens at exactly the same time as the famine and, of course, is carried out by the same people. Um, and, and for Stalin, this was, a, this was a political decision. He wanted to eliminate any pos I mean. Here I will be very brief in the book, I explain at more length what his motives were, but he wanted to eliminate any possible challenge from Ukraine, a political challenge from Ukraine to, to, to the Bolshevik Revolution and to the idea of, of not so much so Russian but Soviet dominance over the region. Um, and he wanted to eliminate any people, in, um, people, groups, ideas in the peasantry, in the cities, in the intellectual community who might challenge Soviet power. And for him, he needed the elimination of Ukraine as a nation was part of this challenge. And you know, this was, of course, um, something that 
um, went back and forth, you know, that in the 20s and the 30s and then again in the 40s and the 50s, Soviet attitudes towards Ukraine modulated. There were different, you know, there were in, the, in the 20s there was an attempt to allow this intellectual flowering. They had the idea that, well, if we allow it in the intellectual world, then we'll control it in the, you know, we'll prevent a military uprising. Later on, they allowed some kind of fake version of Ukraine to exist and so on. So there were different policies at different times, but, you know, from the Moscow's point of view, it was always about um, control. <clears throat> but I, what Stalin did not do, um, he did not try to kill every Ukrainian. Um, and unfortunately, after the Second World War, the word genocide, for many people, even though it's described, defined differently in different documents, intellectually came to mean that. So people thought, and, and the argument you often hear about the Ukrainian famine is, well, he didn't try to kill every Ukrainian. Well, no, he didn't. Um, and this, this, I think, is the origin of the argument. Uh, one, it's one, well, there are a number of arguments. It's one of the difficulties that Ukraine has had in persuading other nations to classify Ukraine as a genocide according to the rules of international law. I'm, I'm, I'm not stating that as a, that I'm for this or against it. I'm just explaining why, why there's been this, uh, you know, why there's this misunderstanding because there's, there, there are more than one definition of genocide in my view, the broader, earlier Lemkin definition certainly applies to Ukraine, but you know, a narrow definition that says ge genocide is only about the physical destruction of people you know, doesn't include it because that's not what Stalin was trying to do. And I think this is the, this is the origin of the, of the difficulty, but I don't think it's a closed question. Um, you know, international, you know, international law also changes, and um, it may be that with time, um, it becomes easier to convince people to ex explain to people what happened here and explain um, why this should be classified as a genocide. But as I say, I think that's a secondary question to the issue of what happened, how did it happen, why did it happen, um, why did Stalin do it, and, and what is the long-term impact? Thank you. Uh, I probably will ask uh, one more question before we uh, we ask audience for, for questions. And um, what I want to say is that uh, your book is one of the best things that ever happened to Ukrainian <laughs> scholarship and, and Ukrainian writing and books on Ukraine abroad. Um, in in uh, English speaking world in particular. Uh, the amount that attention it got, and, and, and it got for very good reason, it, it deserves it, was enormous. Uh, for anyone who is interested, please go and Google an Applebaum and Red Famine, and you will have uh, hundreds of thousands of um, um, hits. And uh, again, you can then try any other book and any other author, and you will appreciate the, the really the, the amount of attention to Ukraine, to Ukrainian history that that book, that book produced. So I, I, I wanted, first of all, to thank you for, for making such an impact. And again, it's, it's broader community, it's academic community, it got, it got, it got a lot of attention. And uh, before, again, I ask audience for the question, I wonder whether that miracle called an apple bomb and red famine will happen anytime soon in the, in the future, whether Ukraine is part of your future thinking, either academic, as a journalist, what, what, what you do in your, in your life as a whole. So, so first of all, thank you, that's very kind. Um, you have also done a lot of work for Ukrainian history, so I, 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 um, you're being overly modest, but um, so I do, I, as a journalist, I do write about Ukraine. Um, I wrote particularly a lot about Ukraine in 2014. Um, uh, I got involved in a lot of debates and arguments about Ukraine, um, and they continue to this day, and I'm sure I will be um, involved further. You and I were discussing a project that I might do in the next year or two, looking at m modern Ukrainian understanding of Ukrainian, <laughs> of Ukrainian history. Um, see, somebody is against us, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but I don't, as I said before, I think my next book will probably be, it may include Ukraine, I'm not sure, it will not be about the Stalin period, 
um, because, as I said, this book, I spent a lot of time with Stalin and Stalinism, and um, I don't think I can do it anymore. Um, my next book will probably be about the 1990s, which is this period of transformation in Central Europe, here, and in Russia. I don't know yet what the scope exactly of the book will be, but um, I, will, I, will, I would like to come back to that. But yes, you know, don't worry, I, haven't, you know, I can't get away from Ukraine now. It's impossible. Okay, well, thank you. I'm very happy that <laughs> you got trapped, yes. So, uh, thank you. And I guess now we can, we can now move on to the questions from the audience. And the idea is that I will try to take two or three questions at once. Please, Pan Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Valentin Olovashenko, now it's Justice Movement representing. First, first to start, Lumila, and thank you very much for this book. This Red Famine is a really outstanding event for Ukraine and I hope for, the, for other countries as well. For Ukrainian diaspora all around the world and uh, communities, Jewish, German, whatever. You mentioned briefly uh, about other communities exterminated, being exterminated during the Red Famine. You are right, it's true. Uh, near Mariupol, uh, during Ukrainian famine, Stalin, Bolsheviks, and Ukrainian Communist Party, they exterminated German uh, villages, even communities, totally. And we have established all, and I am uh, declassified all these archives, and we have delivered it to German parliament for Germany to know whom they have lost within Ukrainian family. There, there's, there's a little bit about the Germans in my book. There yeah, if you will need, please, we'll help you to find out where you can get this data as well. Now it's declassified as all other archives. Plus Jewish communities, you are right, and it's true, they were exterminated with us Ukrainians during the Red Famine. Briefly on genocide. For us, for Ukraine, on both legislative and uh, human uh, dimensions or level, there is no doubt anymore. Eight years ago, we have established in the court that the genocide were organized directly and intentionally against Ukrainian nation, against Ukrainian communities. Even, I like in your book, you have studied with the maps, even in the, uh, the territory of uh, modern Russia. That was where Serhi really did a great job, and it is really uh, proved by the investigators and in Ukrainian court. But my question is brief. Do you have any plans with the presentations after Lviv? Maybe in Ukraine, maybe in other countries, maybe in Russia even, in Russian language, to tell them the truth about what uh, their famous Stalin did to Ukrainian nation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, please. Uh, I'm a physical educational teacher. I would like to contribute to your book. I tell history students what was the uh, criminal essence of the communist regime, but they cannot answer the question. You should have started with the manifesto of the Communist Party of Marx and Lenkis of 1948, the destruction of private property, and you shift the blame on Stalin, but that is a misconception. The blame is that the Lenin took the Marxist theory about the destruction of private property, and Lenin wrote that peasants as a class have to be destroyed because they aspire to become billionaires. This is the essence of these Stalin repressions, but unfortunately, you never reached that. So in future, you must understand that communist ideology is about destruction of private property and all the crimes of Stalinism and Leninism. We go back to this. Let me finish my thought. And it's very important at our universities, this is not, uh, this is a discussion, this is not an argument, there has to be discussion, so I'm trying to engage in a discussion, so our students uh, lack history knowledge, both in schools and universities, and this is something we need to change. The teaching in schools and universities is very weak, and uh, what's the level of history in America? And will it take one more question? Доктор Кузю. 
And I have a solution for your Stalin problem. Watch the British comedy, The Death of Stalin. It'll get rid of... It'll, watch the British comedy, The Death of Stalin. It'll get rid of your Stalin problem, probably. The British always have the best sense of humor. Um, but I have a question more to, I think, Sir Hay. Um, I have the impression, and I'm thinking now that Oris Subtelny's History of Ukraine came out, the first edition came out 30 years ago now, in the late 1980s. Um, um, I have a kind of feeling that in Western departments of history, that historians never go out for lunch together, never have a drink together, never mingle together. Because you have one group of people who are looking at history in a different way, the Mogotchis, Subtelnys, Blockies, and, and other people. But then you have the typical Western history of Russia continues to sprout the same rubbish as it's been doing for, for 50 or 60 years. So, and it's the same kind of theme as you have in Moscow that Russian leaders have, that this is, Kiev Rus is the first Russian state. That there is, Ukrainians don't appear until maybe the Treaty of Pereyaslav, and then maybe later in the 19th century, and then in the revolution. Um, don't you historians ever get together and kind of cross-fertilize? It's like you're leading two different paths. My typical provocative question, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, Um, so, to your question about the, the presentation of the book, um, I have presented it in Kiev already, um, in the, at the Kiev at the Arsenal a couple of months ago. Um, I, would, I hope to do some more events in Ukraine, but we're not quite, we're not quite there yet. Um, it's been presented actually in many American cities, in New York, Chicago, Washington, um, uh, uh, I think one or two others, um, Boston, sorry, <coughs> Harvard. Cambridge. Cambridge. <laughs> um, it, was, it, was, it was presented in London. Um, I was at the Edinburgh Book Festival a month ago talking about it. Um, and, but actually, it might interest you to know that by far the best and most interesting and most enthusiastic reception were at the four or five events I did in Poland. Warsaw, Lviv, uh, I'm sorry, Lviv, Lubin, Warsaw, Lublin, um, Gdańsk, uh, Bydgoszcz, I'm going to Wrocław, I think, in a couple of weeks. Um, it's been, a, it's been a, lots of enthusiasm and interest. It's also coming out in German. Um, it'll come out in French, uh, several other languages um, as well. So, still many to come. Maybe Ludmila would like to say a word or two about the Russian translation. Yeah. <laughs> there, is a, there was a... I can say the following. Firstly, about the presentation of Anne's book. We did talk about uh, having uh, Anne to do a tour across Ukraine. I was surprised to learn that Anne hasn't been but always wanted to visit Kharkiv. And uh, I know that there are people eager to meet her in other cities of Ukraine, and this is something we have in our uh, to-do list and has a very rigid schedule, but she promised that next year, first, the beginning of next year, she'll find an opportunity to present her book in other regions of Ukraine. Also, I know that we'll announce, as now has mentioned it, when we publish this book in Russian language. Let me tell you an interesting thing. The Russian Federation today deserves special attention. Russia has a notion called the list of extremist publications. And uh, this list includes Raphael Lemkin and his works, which is very sad. It indicates something that Anne talked of, the close society, the uh, strategy of imposing 
one dogma on the society that's uh, imposed by the government. But it's very important to have a Russian translation of Anne's book. We had uh, uh, preliminary negotiations with one of the Russian publishing houses first. They were very interested in publishing the book and they wanted to have a look at it. Then they told us that we wish you all the successes in publishing the book, but we're not going to go ahead with publishing the book. And that's good news for us. That means that Ukrainians will publish this book in Russian and I know that this book will have a lot and of And now, Serhii, do historians ever have lunch together? <laughs> yeah, we go, we, we, we go for drinks. Maybe we are drinking wrong stuff, I don't know. But, uh, but generally, yes, th that happens. And I would say that uh, there is a profound change when it comes to Western academia. So in any respectable work or publication, you can't find any more cave in Russia. So it's, 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 it's cave is written with I-E-V, not Y-I-V, uh, but it's Rus, so, and uh, the, the Rus or Rus, as some people pronounce it, it's, it's now the, the absolute standard. So th their change, th their happened, happened major change. Uh, with, with Russia, of course, there is, there, there is a different story and there is much less context today compared to what was five years ago, six years ago. Some people out just as, as a principle wouldn't, wouldn't go to conferences that are organized in Russia. Others would go, but then would, that would become a matter of a major discussion, if not a scandal, in the, in, in the um, uh, social media. So there, there is a really major problem and the gap that is growing. But in the West, it's slow, but it's moving, it seems to me, in, in a much more, much more balanced and productive, productive. Um, yeah, I, I, I actually, I also think it's moving. I mean, there, there are some exceptions. One of them is the, probably unfortunately, one of the best writers about Russia now is Stephen Kotkin, who's very, very resistant to any including any information about Ukraine. He's, he's sort of obsessed with Moscow, Berlin, Washington, big capitals. Um, but uh, nevertheless, my, my experience in presenting the book and in talking about the book at different universities and in different places is that scholars of Russian history are really interested in being part of the debate and so on. And I think the, the debate that you talked about at the beginning in the, um, there was a, in the, in, the, in the contemporary European history academic world was interesting. Lots of, what it was it, eight or nine people contributed. This was a kind of argument among historians about the Ukrainian famine. So um, in, a, in, in the main, one of the main American academic journals. So it's happening. These things take a long time. But, but again, I, I want to stress that we are referring to that publication. It was Anne's book that, 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 that generated that discussion. And it's very interesting, the, the, the title of the discussion are something like Soviet famines, but really the focus is on the famine in Ukraine, on the Ukrainian famine, which is, again, tells you something about at least that part of, 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 of study, that's the, 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 that uh, subfield where it is moving geographically and it is focused on Ukraine today. But it's not to say that there is not a problem, but things are getting better. Uh, попросити так ось, будь ласка, наш наступ, наступне питання. Next question. I have an addition. I'm a journalist from Sumy region. I had dealt with the study of Holodomor in Mykolaiv, Sumy and Potave regions. So I would like to say that my family had survived the famine I know from my family members, I have the photos of the time, but I would like to talk of the great psychological impact that the family sustained and the members of the family uh, carried with them the whole generations. When I took down the memoirs of Holodomor the next morning, people would come to me in the morning asking me not to publish it. And this is modern times. People were still afraid. 
same way their family members were afraid and they published their memoirs only initialed without saying the full name. So this fear is so deep and great in the nation. They so the nation is still rigid and that it cannot live freely. The years of hunger have laid a great impact on my nation. And that is a great damage and great impact on the free development of the nation. And I think it's one of the greatest crimes that uh, impeded the free development of the nation. I would like to give you a reply. You've raised a critical question of psychological and other impacts of Olodomor. The Anne's book is unique in that, unlike other researchers, who describe Holodomor, but only deal with the political side of the story, but only deal with the economic side of the story. But Anne's book is, has synthesized the areas. And there's a lot of attention to the people's emotions and the consequences of Holodomor. So I will pose your question to Anne. Tell us, how difficult was it for you to work with this topic and how the human story is personally difficult for you to take in? How did you deal with the material? Reading is uh, really painful, same as Ulah. Yes. <coughs> Um, so first of all, thank you for the for the commentary. Um, yes, it's true that in all of my books, I try to use as much um, first person testimony, whether it's from interviews or from oral history or from memoirs, as I can. Um, uh, as as much as possible, I want the people who have experienced things to tell the story themselves. Um, after all, it's not my story, the story of the Holodomor, it's their story, and so I want their language to be featured in the book as much as I can do it. Um, that was a little bit harder with this book than some previous ones because, um, you know, there really isn't anybody alive, and if they're alive, they're very, very, very old and not, you know, who, who, who really remembers it. Um, so, you know, first-person testimony, so I was reliant on um, the uh, or you know interviews that were done some 10, 20, or 30 years ago, um, but I think that's a really important part of any story, not just in not just for historians, but also for the reader to have some some contact with the actual people and the actual experience. You know, so it's not just me telling them what happened; it's the actual people speaking to themselves. Um, the impact on me is hard to describe. I, I, I um, um, you know, in a way, as soon as you start a project like this, I mean, Sarah, he must also have this experience. You, be, you have to kind of distance yourself from it and be very technical, you know, you know, I need this piece of information, I need that piece of information. You know, it's, it's like doing a puzzle, you know, you're putting together different things and you're looking for testimony and so on. You know, and if you, if you spend the whole time, um, you know, if you you know you you can't you can't cry every time you read a testimony, or you won't ever write your book. Um, but I I I have found almost as a kind of you know the books are accumulating. In some ways, this book was the worst and most difficult one that I wrote because um, you know the the memoirists of the Gulag, you know, they were intellectuals and they wrote these wonderful novels, you know, Shalamov, I don't know, Yevgeny Ginsberg, you know, they survived, then they wrote about it, they, they, you know, they, had, they learn lessons from it, they write interesting portraits of their fellow prisoners and so on. In this story, you're talking about um, very poor and um, sometimes not, you know, illiterate peasants dying of hunger, and there is really, there is no positive story. There is nothing that you can tell from that that is, um, that, that, is, that is uplifting, so it's a very difficult story. And um, in, 
pro probably the effect of writing all these books has made me a kind of, I'm not exactly a pessimist, I don't live my life, you know, I'm not unhappy all the time, but I'm very, um, maybe it's made me even in my journalism very pessimistic about contemporary events, or at least very, pessimistic is the wrong word, maybe very, um, you know, I'm, I, you know, I, I I, I, I worry about idealists. I worry about optimists. I worry about people who think everything is great. You know, I'm, I'm always reminded of the dark side of humanity or something like that. I don't want to sound too grandiose, but you know, these books are a kind of, you know, we all now live, I mean, for all the problems that we now have, you know, despite the war in the East and the war in Syria and other, you know, we do now live in an unbelievably wealthy, you know, and very prosperous and relatively peaceful time in the world. And, you know, it, this city is, maybe it doesn't feel like that to all of you, but is, you know, probably wealthier and um, more prosperous than it has almost ever been in history. Um, and, you know, we should all appreciate that, um, even while remembering that, you know, the past can always come back and these terrible events can always return. Thank uh, you. I have this kind of question. Have you researched the question about the attitude of the American government to the events happening in, during Holodomor in Ukraine? Why was it at that time that the United States uh, diplomatically recognized the Soviet Union? Why during the Holodomor the American government made a diplomatic recognition of the Soviet Union? Um, so that's a difficult question. There, there's a chapter in the book about um, foreign understanding of the famine and how it was understood abroad and um, you know it requires a long explanation and so on. Um, but I wouldn't point to just the United States. I would look at really every country in Europe. Um, I would look at Poland, I would look at Germany, I would look at France. Um, the, the, the news about the famine, uh, you know, it came out. People did know about it. People in, Western, in Eastern Poland knew about it from their friends and neighbors and cousins across the border. A few journalists knew about it. Um, uh, some diplomats knew about it. Not so much American diplomats because there weren't any at that time, but Italian diplomats, uh, Polish diplomats, you know, they were, even British diplomats were writing back to, um, to their home countries describing what was happened. Um, but, you know, it, the, the story never came out in a form that, that ever penetrated the mainstream. It was never, it was never accepted or understood or considered to be important by anyone in power. Um, did Roosevelt know about the famine? Probably not. Did some diplomats lower down know about the famine? Yes, probably. But it's a, the, the actual, the story of how the Ukrainian famine was understood um, and described at the time is actually a really fascinating story about what we know and how we know it and what it takes for a piece of news to be believed. Um, another one story which is very famous and you probably know in my book that I tell is the story of two journalists who wrote about the famine. Um, one of them was a very young um, British journalist um, named Gareth Jones, um, who, was, who, who came to Ukraine and, um, you know, he famously, he took a train from Moscow to, to Kharkiv. Uh, he got off the train about halfway to Kharkiv and walked through Ukraine in the March of 1933 at the height of the famine. And he's really, I think, the only Western eyewitness who saw the villages and so on. And he described it, he wrote about it, he did a, he actually gave a press conference um, a month or two later in Berlin describing the famine. Um, but because of who he was, he was very young, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't famous. Um, his, his version of what had happened really didn't penetrate. You know, the, the other famous story is the story of Walter Durante, who was a very well-known, respected journalist for the New York Times, actually British, but, but um, writing for the American press. And he was, and he also very, um, was a journalist who was read very closely by Roosevelt. Um, and he wrote 
um, a very categorical denial that there was a famine. Um, he explicitly contradicted the writings of Gareth Jones. He wrote that Jones was a very nice young man, but he didn't really understand the situation and so on. So um, the, the definitive story was told by this, but, you know, this famous New York Times Moscow correspondent, and that would have been what Roosevelt read. Um, so although I c you can blame, um, you know, you can blame Roosevelt for many things, um, the version of the of Soviet history and, and really Soviet contemporary politics that he knew probably came from Walter Durante, um, who was who who had denied the famine. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't think the U.S. administration acted deliberately, knowing that there was a famine, and 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 made this recognition anyway. Um, stepping back from it, it's um, it's a good lesson in. Um, not just for Ukraine, but for, you, you know, in, in trying to understand why we know things or why we recognize things at the time. I mean, I could, I could write, we could ask the same question right now about Syria. You know, there is a hideous war going on in Syria. There are literally millions of refugees living in camps all over the Middle East, in Lebanon, in Turkey, as we know famously, some of them have tried to come to Europe. Um, and how much are our governments doing about this? How much are they reacting to it? How much do people care about it? How much do people talk about it? Um, actually, we've learned to live with this terrible tragedy, which isn't that far away from us. Syria is not, you know, it's across the Mediterranean. Um, it's not, you know, it's not on the other side of the world. Um, so I think this, this phenomenon of, um, um, you know, ignoring or dismissing or not taking into account tragedies is not unique to the Ukrainian famine. Прошу в першому ряді два питання і і ще одне там Good afternoon, uh, Ms. Applebaum. Nice having you. Thank you for your book and efforts. So my name is Yulia and I am an, a lawyer and I have this question. So as a world expert in hold the more issue, what do you think? Um, what is your opinion? Would establishing a, a successful Ukrainian version of um, Nuremberg process uh, be beneficial for all the crimes of communism, including Holodomor? And at this time, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and there were two people over here. I, I just, in English. <laughs> Dear Anne, let me address you this way because you are a favorite uh, author of our family. <laughs> My son already has read this book in English, but I prefer to read it in Ukrainian. But still, I appreciate your great effort in defending Ukraine in the West, in your articles, in your speeches. Uh, especially remember your uh, debate with Stephen uh, Cohen and others. So uh, um, I uh, want to say that we uh, greatly in Ukraine appreciate uh, uh, your writing and uh, your, this book as well, of course. Um, and my question uh, concerns um, uh, the process of, in the process of writing, did you have in mind this comparison of Holocaust and uh, Holodomor, um, and uh, how you uh, see this, um, those um, articles. It was not uh, articles, it was such um, notes in a blog of Alexander Motil, who uh, tried a few years ago, uh, tried to uh, compare the uh, interpretation and consideration in uh, scientific literature and uh, publicist uh, works of Holocaust and Holodomor and uh, interpretation of causes of meaning and so on. Did you uh, uh, think about that while writing this book and uh, how you see this question? in general. I think that this is a good contribution to understanding of these two tragedies, human tragedies, 
which were caused by two big totalitarian dictators in Europe and Eastern Europe at that time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I understand there is uh, one more question there. Yes. Uh, thank you for your visit uh, to Ukraine and for your great uh, book. And I'll pose my question in Ukrainian just to make it clear. They say that when you research a certain topic, a certain area, well, for me it's about Stalin. You've analyzed his decisions and uh, write in such great detail that you knew his thinking, his decision-making process. Wasn't it tempting to acquit him for some decisions or to make him a hostage of the system or the, his need to cling to power? That's my first question. And the second question is about working with memoirs and uh, uh, interviews of the horrible events. The psychologists say that when you work with human memoirs, with human memory, there are two traps. Firstly, the memory is not is an imperfect instrument, and we are prone to forget quickly, and that the data which is beneficial to us, we forget them, we, want, we try to disclose. So how did you uh, try to strike a balance and give a rational interpretation? Okay, um, let, me, let me first answer the question about the Nuremberg trial. Should there be a Nuremberg trial? So, uh, um, it's, I kind of, I hesitate to answer because it's somewhat up to Ukraine and Ukrainians. It's not really for me to tell you how to deal with your own past. Um, the only thing I would, I would be careful of in the, the trial scenario is, um, you know, in a, imitating what was done after the Second World War might not be the right answer for Ukraine now. Um, the crimes we're talking about were a long time ago. Most of the perpetrators aren't alive. Um, does it make sense to put on trial, I don't know, Petrovsky or Stalin or, or um, uh, uh, you know, people, people who aren't alive anymore? It's a little bit, um, it doesn't have the same force and power. Um, you know, in, in a way, I'd rather have Ukrainians, um, you know, the, a, a more appropriate way for this moment might be not a legal, um, not a legal trial, but a historical debate, one that involves more people, one that, um, you know, one that involves a deeper reflection about the impact, you know, as the, as the, um, as was mentioned before, the deeper psychological impact on Ukrainians. I mean, it might, it might make sense now to, for the, for the discussion of the past to take a, a slightly different form. I mean, I, I don't think, I would have to see what, I'm not against it in principle, but it would seem to me that it matters a lot that it not become something of interest only to lawyers or to politicians, but it would be better to have a, a process that includes um, the whole country. And I think some of those things are actually being done now. So, so, um, so maybe not. What was the second question was about? The second question was about Holocaust and the Holocaust. Oh, the Holocaust and the Holodomor. So I, I haven't, um, you know, I haven't sat down and made the comparison, you know, making a making an exact comparison. I agree with you that it's important to see them as two phenomenon that took place really in some cases in exactly the same places, you know, at, in very, you know, very near in time to one another. Um, within the context of these two great totalitarian empires, the Nazi, you know, the Nazi regime and the Soviet regime. Um, the scholar who's probably come the closest already to making the comparison, of course, you know, is Timothy Snyder, who, you know, wrote a very brilliant book in which he talked about really this region, Poland, Ukraine, and the Baltic states, 
um, and you know, as, the, as in a way the focus of both of those empires and the focus of the crimes, both of the Nazis and of the, and of the Soviet Union and in, in some places for similar and comparable reasons. And I think that's a really useful way to look at the story. And if you haven't read Bloodlands, um, I think that's a really brilliant attempt to do, to do that. Um, I mean, again, my, my purpose in writing this book was not to somehow compete with the Holocaust or, you know, create some kind of alternative to the Holocaust. I was trying to, as I said, trying to show what happened in Ukraine and what were the, um, and what were the motivations. But, you know, and I'm, I'm always a little, I like Tim Snyder's book because it, it takes a step back and looks at, you know, a larger picture. I'm, you know, I'm, re I'm always reluctant to make these exact comparisons because um, sooner or later, people want to know, well, which was worse, you know, and, and the answer is which was worse depends on who you are. If you're a Ukrainian peasant in, you know, Kievsky Oblast, you know, in 1933, then the Holodomor is worse. You know, if you're a Jewish peasant, um, you know, maybe a little around here, um, a few years later, then the Hol Holocaust is worse. So it's a, it, you know, I didn't really want to be involved in that argument about, you know, who, who's worse. But I agree, I agree with you that they're interesting to compare because, you know, of course they're very different. They use different technologies and people, different ideologies and so on, but there are elements that are the same. I mean, this, certainly the element of um, discounting the humanity of a particular group of people, seeing them as not worthwhile, not useful, you know, unimportant to the state, a group of people that you need to eliminate in order to have, to have a better state. Um, you can see this way of thinking um, in both situations. And so that, that of course, um, makes it interesting. Um, then the question was about how I use sources. So, of course, there is no such thing as a perfect source. Um, there, there is no testimony that is perfect. We all have flawed memories. Um, there is no document that is perfect. You know, documents were um, made by particular people for particular reasons. Um, you know, every, um, you know, every chinovnik, you know, every bureaucrat who was writing something, you know, to, you know, to keep a record for the secret police had a boss and he knows that he's writing for the boss. And so he includes some things and leave them out. Um, this is the reason why in all of my books, I try to use a range of sources. So I use um, official documents, I use newspapers and books written at the time, I use you know, historian work, and I use testimony. And I, you know, I, I try to get more than one perspective on every event. You, know, you can't always do that. Um, and of course, you're always, you know, when you're dealing with the past, just by the way, like when you're dealing with the present, there are some guesses that you make um, there are some, um, you know, knowing a, the wide, you know, a, a situation, you know, you have to, you know, it's in some cases in the book, I show different versions of the same event. I mean, one of them, for example, was the death of Stalin's wife. Stalin's wife killed herself. And at the time, many people said she killed herself because she knew about the famine. This may or may not be true. I mean, maybe she, she seemed to have been some kind of depression. We don't, we don't really know why Stalin's wife killed herself, but at the time this was said, later on it was said, and so I use that in the book as a way of saying, well, you know, if nothing else, this shows you how important the famine was in Moscow, how angry the conversation was, how, how upset people inside the, at the very highest levels of the Bolshevik party were about the famine. You know, you can, you can learn things from what people were saying, even if we don't really know what was true. So I, I always tried to sh use different documents to, to, to show different sides of the story. But I agree with you, of course, nobody, um, nobody knows, you know, every, 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 every document has some, some, some flaw. Um, and finally, what was the last question? And I don't know. When you were trying to understand Stalin, whether there were ever a temptation also to just explain or excuse Oh, I see, him, as a right? Right? So, yes, so well, actually, the, the so, were. so this, so you know, um, in Stalin's own mind, what he did was justified. So, in other words, and the language that he used and that was then adopted by other people, and you see this in the secret police reports, you see it in the in the in the way people talk about it. They all understood that what they were doing was justified in the name of Marxist ideology, and they had a.
and, and it was all done in the name of the greater good of the Soviet Union. Um, so, and trying to understand what was their justification is very important because when you want to know, when you want to understand motivation, so, you know, in order for the famine to happen, um, many, you know, not just policemen, but also ordinary people, including some ordinary Ukrainians, had to go into other people's houses and confiscate their food. So as we all know, the famine was not the result of a natural disaster. It was the result of confiscation. People came into their houses, they took the food. Why did people do this? Who did it? You know, why did they do it? And there's a number of answers to that that are in the book, but one of the answers is they were given this, you know, this kind of ideological, political justification for doing it. So they, th they thought they were right to do it. You know, they thought that confiscating the food from poor peasants was right. And um, so in Stalin's mind and in the minds of the system, it was correct. Um, that doesn't mean that I have to accept that logic or that you should accept that logic, but it's important to explain in, you know, as, ex as, an, as an explanation for people's motivations um, what they were doing. So I think, you know, I th you know, of course Stalin was part of a system and he was working on behalf of that system. And then, of course, that system was in turn influenced by him. He was its leader, and he was he was setting the the most important parameters. But he was not the only he was not the only perpetrator. You know, the book I think makes very clear that there were lots of people involved in the famine in you know in Moscow, but also in Kiev, in Kharkiv, in Ukraine, uh, even in villages. And explaining their motivation was is is part of the what, what's in the book. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we are uh, here in this room now for a little bit more than one hour and a half, and I think maybe the time has come for the last question. Uh, and we have we have a gentleman over there who is prepared to, uh, to ask. Okay, two two uh, questions. So the last round of questions. Yes, please. My name is Volodymyr Senkiv. I prefer to uh, ask my question in Ukrainian. Uh, I would like to uh, use the phrase that you used at the beginning. You were saying that the idea of the study was to try to better understand Russia, try to better understand what was happening here in Central Eastern Europe. So tell us. What conclusions about Russia and Ukraine, about this part of Europe, do you make for yourself from this immersion into history? Perhaps uh, we can uh, transplant some ideas onto modern time, and there are some answers uh, to the war that we now have in the East. Thank you so much for the discussion, Anne and Serhii. Um, so I have a very broad question, um, in particular to Anne. Um, so having dealt with researching, you know, atrocities in gulag camps and, you know, in the case of Ukraine, so what would be the one, two, or three lessons or that you have learned about human nature, um, and maybe you know, a couple takeaways that we as citizens and as human beings could, you know, you know, learn and take and that would kind of help us in our lives and then the society and humanity in general. Thank you. Well, uh, excellent questions and they're inter, in, in, interrelated, yes. yes. So this is a very good question about um, Ukraine and Russia. Um, you know, <coughs> one of the lessons, one of the things that became clear to me in the book was the way in which Stalin saw um, Ukraine as a threat to him and to his empire, um, not just not just not you know not just power in Kiev but power in Moscow. Um, it seems to me that Putin today sees Ukraine in a similar way. In other words, 
when he saw the events here in Maidan in 2014, he didn't just see a kind of local problem in Ukraine, he saw something that threatens him, you know, him in, in Moscow and his kind of regime in Moscow. You know, this, you know, all these young people on the street waving, you, you know, European flags, um, calling for, you know, an end to corruption, you know, this is exactly what he is afraid of in Moscow. Um, and the reason why his reaction was so extreme, both the invasion of Crimea and then the invasion of uh, Donetsk, was I think because this is the kind of movement and the kind of this democracy movement is exactly the kind of um, political challenge that he personally is afraid of. In other words, for Russian leaders, and Stalin is not a Russian leader, he's a Soviet leader, but for, for leaders in Moscow, what happens in Kiev, what happens in Lviv, what happens in Ukraine, um, um, affects them, you know, they think that it affects them and their power. They are afraid of a kind of, um, you know, anti-oligarchic, um, anti-corruption ideology that might come from Ukraine, just as in the past they were afraid of the way this liberal nationalism in Ukraine might, might affect the, the Bolshevik revolution. So there's a way in which, um, you, you know, from, you know, these are, I don't, I don't want to make any direct comparison between Putin and Stalin. I think this is, you know, this is not correct. But there is a way in which um, we should, don't underestimate the degree to which Moscow will always look on Ukraine as a challenge. Um, and will always see the politics of Ukraine as somehow affecting the politics of Moscow and of Russia. So that, that's in a way a kind of, that was one of the deepest things that I got from the book, this, this kind of, um, this kind of reflection. I mean, as for, you know, deeper, deeper reflections about humanity, um, you know, I, as I, somebody asked me before, I think Ludmila asked me before about how I dealt with these very difficult questions. Um, in the first version of this, the, I read an epilogue to the book, the last part, I, I did write a very pessimistic epilogue, in other words, um, about the famine and, um, very negative, and I gave it to a young Ukrainian woman, who, a historian who was working with me, and I asked her to read it. And she wrote back to me, she said, you can't end this book on this negative note because it's unfair to modern Ukraine. Um, and she said, look, you know, what is your book about? Your book is about Stalin's attempt to destroy Ukraine. And look, he failed, you know, it didn't work, you know, it didn't succeed. You know, Ukraine is now independent. Um, we now have open discussions of these issues. Um, we now have our own historians. We have our own lawyers. Um, we have people who can speak for us now. You know, this is actually, you know, your book is a very sad and negative story, um, but history can turn around again. Um, and I think uh, the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the deeper lesson, maybe, I mean, there are a number of, I could, I could say many things in answer to your question, but one of the lessons is that um, history can be turned around, that um, there is no, uh, you know, Stalin's attack on Ukraine was not the end of Ukraine, um, and that, you know, people are, you, you know, we're always, we always, we're always writing our own story, and the story can always change. Um, and I hope that Ukrainians will take that as a lesson that they can also build their own country um, and they can continue to make it something better. Well, thanks. Thank you again. Before I give my final thanks to Anne and, and to the publisher, I want to sh share with you um, a phrase, or maybe more than that, that I learned from Anne uh, at one of her book presentations, and that it went something like that, that buying a book is a moral equivalent of reading it. Uh, so I, I assure you that uh, we authors publishing in Ukraine really don't get uh, much of honorarium, if any, but the publishers who do that, they need your support. So I certainly, I certainly encourage you to buy the book, and now I guess I am ready to thank Anne on behalf of all of you and all of her readers, current and дякую. future. Дорогі друзі, і будь ласка, ми вас запрошуємо на наш стенд номер 325, і там можна буде мати не просто книжку, але книжку з підписом Anne.